Hello. Hello. All right. So, how many of you guys have watched uh, Independence Day? Uh, how about 2001 A Space Odyssey? Alien? How about War of the Worlds? I've watched all of them except Alien. I won't watch that because I'm too scared. But anyway, what they have in common is the concept of alien encounters. I am a big fan of this topic because in general, I am just a huge fan of science fiction and fantasy. And this really gets me thinking, you know? Because what if there are aliens out there? Are there? We have all thought about this at some point, you know, the big question, is there anybody other than humans out there? There are really only two possible answers to this question, yes or no. If we are alone, then, well, I don't have much to talk to you about. Um, the universe is dead, space is empty, and we are doomed to eternal loneliness. It's frankly depressing as we, we may look at the night sky in fear that as far as we go and as long as we look, we will only find barren rocks and dry ice. But the alternative is that we look up at the stars and see something looking back. And that is a different type of fear entirely. You see, humans have basically colonized the entire Earth by now, and we are already thinking about journeying to other planets and other star systems. And it won't be long on a universal timescale before we actually do this. And then we will have to seriously consider the implications of this question. Because, you see, when we deal with alien civilizations, a big problem we will face is that we can't really talk to them. Look at it like this. If you are another person, and I'm also a human, it's re really easy for us to talk to each other. Even if we don't speak the same language, I can do hand gestures, facial expressions, I can draw things, I can mimic actions, and I can tell you a whole lot just by that. And it will be really easy to just find a common language or make one out of scratch. But with aliens, that won't work, because their brains are so different to ours, that so fundamentally different that we can't really say anything that they will make sense out of and vice versa. We have no common reference. So the result of this is that our most blatant declaration of peace will be as unintelligible as a declaration of war. And so when we meet aliens, if we do, then depending on which logic we pursue, things could go one out of two ways. Here's the first. So the first is the cinema classic and one that all the movies have in common, which is, well, f first let me ask you a question. Do you think there are aliens out there? Most people you ask will answer something like, probably. You know, the universe is so big, what are the odds that intellig intelligent aliens haven't developed somewhere? And that logic makes sense. Except for the fact that, where are all the aliens? We have looked far and wide and seen nothing. You know, the universe is 14 billion years old. If, let's say, humanity could move at 0.1% the speed of light, which isn't that much at all, then we could colonize the entire Milky Way galaxy in 100 million years. This is not long at all on the, on the timescale of the universe, which is 14 billion years old. Since its start, since its beginning, a single alien civilization could have colonized our entire galaxy 14,000 times over. If we go by means of statistics, then that means there, we should have aliens on the next star system. We should have aliens here. The universe should be packed, but there is nothing. Not only do no star systems show any sign of intelligent civilization, but there is no evidence to suggest that a huge galactic empire has ever existed. This is called the Fermi Paradox. The, the, the idea that there should be aliens out there, but there is nothing, and the universe is completely dark. One hypothesis that explains the Fermi Paradox is called the Dark Forest Hypothesis. The term itself uh, comes from uh, a sci uh, science fiction series by Liu Cixin. It's rather a very fantastic read. I very much recommend it. The idea itself is older, but the term dark forest perfectly encapsulates the logic of the argument, which goes a little something like this. Imagine that, for the sake of simplicity, you and I are alien the only two civilizations in the universe. I am desperate to find out if there are others like me, so I broadcast as much information out into space as I can. I try to make my presence known in any way that seems feasible. You are more advanced than me and you are aware of my presence, but for now, I'm not aware of yours. What you know is this. You would do anything to survive. It is only natural. Evolution selects for those who care, take the best care of themselves. You also know that you want to expand. Take a look at us humans, for example. Every civilization has been more or less an aggressive expansionist because the more 
you want to expand, the more resources you have, the more powerful you are, the more likely you are to survive. And it makes sense that other civilizations, in the same way, as if by natural selection, would want to expand as well. But you also know, the third thing, is that the universe has limited resources. And you can also conclude that I am well aware of this fact. So when dealing with me and deciding what to do, you have to understand that you cannot hope to guess my intentions. My crying out in the darkness could be a declaration of peace or a declaration of war. You simply have no way to tell. And you know, you, because you can judge by your own technology, it can uh, advance rapidly and suddenly. In as few as a few hundred years, I could become even more advanced than you. You never know when a genius is going to be born on my planet. So it won't be long, you don't know how long it will be, but it may very well happen in, uh, in the next hundred years, that I will become aware of your presence, and in the same dilemma will be open before me, and I will have to consider the same things you are doing. And I might not be as hesitant as you. I might decide that, what if you are violent? What if you want to steal my resources? What if you, because you want to expand and know that you can't, I, I just won't give my resources to you willingly, what if you're just willing to come and take them? What if you're willing to kill me? What if, you're just want, what if you just want to kill for the sake of killing? I cannot g hope to guess your intentions just as you cannot g guess mine. And so I might decide that the safest course of action open to me is to eliminate you as quickly as possible before you ever get to hurt me because I want to survive no matter what. You are aware that, that those thoughts could very well cross my mind. And so therefore, the best course of action open to you, the safest bet, is to never place your life in my hands in the first place. It is to kill me and kill me now before I ever get the chance to become a threat. This means that when, apply, when you apply this logic to the entire universe, each civilization is a hunter stalking through a dark forest, knowing it will do anything to survive and knowing that each hunter it meets will also be willing to do anything to survive. It knows that there are limited resources, but everyone you want, everybody wants them, but there is only so much. And it knows the safest bet is to eliminate everybody it sees and to stay as quiet and hidden as possible. Therefore, the universe is not dark because it is empty, but because to be seen is to die and to see is to kill. Of course, this is all basically speculation. We're basing this off of assumptions that we make off of a sample size of one, just us. We can't really know what the aliens will do. And there are many other solutions to the Fermi paradox which do not involve violent aliens at all. In fact, we humans have, on average, become more peaceful as we progress, not more violent. So we could assume that they, something similar would have happened with the aliens. So let's run all of this back. Let's say that we do meet the aliens again, but this time both of us decide to be peaceful about it. We now know or hope or just guess that their intentions are something other than let's harvest the humans' organs for space cheese. So how do we go about communicating with them then? It's still a very difficult problem to overcome because, as I mentioned, we have our brains have so little in common, potentially, that there's essentially nothing that we can say to them that they will understand. Well, essentially, but not quite nothing. Because, you see, uh, most of you probably already saw this coming, but the one thing we can be certain of, of the aliens, is that they are capable of doing math. Because, while well, they have technology. After all, we can establish contact through radio communication. They have spaceships. They have a civilization that is noticeable in space. They have technology. And to have technology, they must have an understanding of physics and therefore of math. So let's start from there. We need, need to tell them what amount we mean by each number. One means a singular amount. Two means twice that. Three, one over that. From there, we can move on to more complicated operations, such as multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. From there, we will be able to show them all of the mathematical syntax that we have developed by comparing it to their own system of mathematics, which, as I mentioned, they have to have. They will be able to, in a sense, decipher the information that we're giving to them, and we will be able to decipher whatever they tell us. As long as, that, as long as that thing is something related to math. It will be difficult. It, it will be like learning a new language for our mathematicians and computers, but it is a language they can learn because, after all, they just speak a different dialect of it. So, simple, right? Once we have math, we can move on to physics. 
all we need to do is show them a diagram or some mathematical equations that represent a hydrogen atom. From there, we can tell them what we mean by a kilogram, simply how many hydrogens constitute what we call a kilogram. Then we can tell them how many times the radius of that hydrogen atom constitutes what we call a meter, and then how many meters light travels in what we call a second. From there, we can tell them basically anything. We can tell them how we define chemistry, and from there, how we define biology. This will give us what we didn't have before, which is a comprehensive base on which we can ground our communication, because we will have a common vocabulary to them. Using it, this vocabulary that we now share, we will be able to define whatever we wish. Which sounds simple enough, it takes time, but we already know what should happen. Except that there are a couple of things, a couple of places where this could go wrong. And they're quite surprising. Here are a couple. So, one problem is that when you're talking to aliens, uh, there are a couple of things that are very subjective that we seem like take for granted, but in reality are very difficult to explain. One such thing is the concept of left and right. It is crucial to physics and chemistry, but how could you possibly tell somebody who doesn't already know what left and right is, what is left and right? This arises from the problem that when you look at a video of, let's say, a person talking or ocean waves crashing on the beach or any physical process, you won't be able to tell if it's the original video or a mirrored version of it unless there was some reference. In other words, unless you already knew if it was or not, if it was mirrored or not. This is called the Ozma problem. And it specifically counts for aliens that are very far away from us. Because if the aliens are very far away, this means that we don't have any common frame of reference with them. We can't point to something and say, this is on your left or this is on your right. Which means that it becomes essentially impossible to explain to them which, dir which direction will be their left and their right. But, as it turns out, there is a way we can tell them. You see, for most of physics, uh, if you have a system that produces an output, a mirrored version of the system will produce a mirrored version of the output, meaning that they could just do the thing we're telling them to do in a mirror and they will get uh, an indistinguishable result, but it will be mirrored, so they will get left and right wrong. But there are some things that don't happen that way. Notably, nuclear decay. See, some atoms, some atomic nuclei, are very unstable. They really don't want to stay together. So they will decay into a more stable form, often by releasing another particle. Most often they release an electron. It's a very common way of radioactive decay. This electron has a property called spin. It is literally spinning I in space, making a sort of corkscrew shape as it moves. And the funny thing is that regardless of whether the original atom is a mirrored version or not, the electron it produces will always be spinning to the left or the right depending on the isotope. So all we need to do to tell them which way is left and right is tell them, look at the radioactive decay of this specific atomic nuclei. It will produce a particle with these specific qualities which we can describe to them because we already have a common base of physics with them. This particle that it produces will be spinning in the direction we call left. Problem solved, right? Well, as it turns out, there is an even deeper level to this problem, which is, in short, this. When the universe was, when the universe started with the Big Bang, a lot of energy was organized in the form of matter, which is what we are made out of, which is what most of the universe is made out of. But some of, s a lot of energy, some, very little compared to the amount that exists as matter, but still quite a substantial amount, exists as antimatter. Antimatter is a sort of counterpart to matter. There are anti-electrons, anti-protons, anti-everything. And th the couple of funny things about antimatter is that, one, there's a lot less of it than matter. Most of the ma matter is regular matter and not antimatter. But there's still an enough antimatter to potentially make an alien. Second thing is that antimatter, when it touches regular matter, both annihilate into pure energy, which means, unfortunately, that if the aliens were made out of antimatter and we and we gave them a high five, uh, we would both be completely obliterated by an explosion several times stronger than the strongest nuclear bomb. And the third funny thing about antimatter is that it behaves in the opposite way than regular matter does, which means that if we tell the aliens to look at the decay of a specific nucleus and they happened to be made of antimatter, their nucleus would also be made of antimatter. And the thing it will produce is a particle that spins not to the left, but to the right, which can lead to confusion very quickly. And antimatter interacts with itself the same way that matter interacts with itself, meaning from very far away, we can't really tell if the aliens are made of antimatter or regular matter. 
So now, not only do we need to tell them which way is left and right, but what we call matter and what antimatter. Well, here's a way we can tell them. There is a particle called a count. It is a subatomic particle, and it exists for a very tiny fraction of a second, almost instantaneously evaporates. But when it does, when it decays, it decays into one of two things, either an electron or an anti-electron, also called a positron. And the thing is, it decays into electrons slightly less often than it does into anti-electrons, which means that we need to tell them, just look at a count. The particle it decays into slightly less often is made out of what we call matter, and the other thing is antimatter. And counts do this regardless of whether they're made from matter or antimatter. So a cown will still decay into an electron slightly less often, just as an anticown will decay into an electron slightly less often. So to summarize, how do we tell the aliens which way is left? Well, we tell them, build a particle accelerator, step one. Step two, look at a cown, which has specific properties which we will describe to them. The particle it decays into slightly less often is what we call matter, and then if you make a specific nucleus out of what we call matter, and it will decay, producing a particle which has a specific spin, that is the direction we call left. How this is useful, um, I don't know, but probably somebody will figure something out. So the, the chief thing I want you to take away from this is that when we deal with aliens, things really could go either way. One, one way of thinking about this is, scary and depressing and that we should kill the aliens and that we should stay silent and never speak out of fear that we ourselves will get killed. And the other is well, somewhat boring and overly technical. But the thing is, as I said at the beginning of this TED talk, we will have to consider this eventually. Humans are bound to leave our humble little home and venture between the stars with enough ambition to fill the entire universe. And we can only assume that there very well may be others with similar ambitions to us and we will either get along with them or not. If it's the former and we get lucky, then, well, good news for us, we should probably get our calculators. But if we decide the risk is not worth taking, well, in that case, we should keep a couple of nuclear missiles handy, you know, just in case. Right. Thank you.